Hey, welcome to another episode of Heretics Against Heresy, where we hope to share what we learn, inspire others, and create faithful students of the Word. I'm Ken, along with my daughter, Sabrina. Hello. Today's episode is an interesting one, we feel, and that is really focusing on the seeker-sensitive movement and, you know, and I guess air quotes, the purpose-driven church, correct? Yep. So um, I think the first thing we're going to start talking about here is maybe a few topics here about churches and different aspects of church and you know, over the next few weeks, we'll unwind that or next few episodes. But let's talk about what is a seeker-sensitive church, for those who may not know the term. Theopedia defines it as a modern approach to public worship and evangelism, whereby a church service is structured in a way that is sensitive to seekers, those who are interested or curious about the church. In other words, church services are designed to appeal to the unchurched, non-Christian, in an attempt to draw them to a church community where they might receive the gospel and be converted. This uh, movement really kind of started, you know, a while back. Um, a guy by the name of Robert Sculler, um, he, he started this with taking a marketing approach to Christianity, applying some business tactics, and, you know, it was almost like, hey, let's, let's figure out what people want and let's make a church that looks like that and we'll have more people. So in other words, you know, I think it was driven by the, act, driven by the idea of having more people come to church regardless of the outcomes. Serena, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, before we just dive into more of this concept of um, a secret sense of church, I just want to make the distinction between what do we mean when we say church. So we have the church as the uh, universal body of Christ, which is the way it's used in the Bible, the uh, universal fellowship of believers. And you also have churches as in the individual buildings that people meet. And a lot of times in the secret sense of movement, there's a back and forth flipping of these terms and a very confusion on when they're talking about one versus the other. So A lot of times when we talk about the church in the Bible, it's the universal church, not necessarily a meeting place. But when they talk about church, often it is the uh, building that you go to to do worship. Right. Absolutely. There's there's different ways of looking at it. And we we typically think about the building where people go on Sundays when it's not an NFL football Sunday, right, Um, in today's world. Uh, But one of the things that or some of the things that Sculler, you know, talked about was he wanted to impress the unchurched, uh, didn't want to be controversial because they felt that sin was a lack of self-esteem. And, uh, you know, they, they took a very universalist approach that we're all children of God. And, and, you know, quite frankly, you know, the first thing that I, I think about when we go through this material, and maybe you'll draw the similar conclusion, is, you know, I, I think this is an evangelical problem, right? If we're, if we're letting Sunday be the, the mode of evangelism, then I think we, we've kind of missing something. Any thoughts? Right. I mean, I think if we look at it biblically, our worship services, our, what we could, would now call Sunday services, are not meant to be the way that we draw people into the church. The Sunday services are the gathering of those who are in the church to come together and worship God and to be in community with other believers. Our Sunday services are not meant to be, oh, look, let's go check this out. This looks fun to like the unchurched, if we're going to use their terminology. Um, the way that we reach the unchurched really should be through evangelism, through going out. Um, Jesus doesn't tell us in the Great Commission to go and set up a church that people are going to look pretty. It's go into all the world. Go out. I am sending you out. That is the language that's used Absolutely. when we talk about drawing people into the church and into the fold of God. It's not a sit here and let people come. It's go out. Yeah, and, and when we start talking about increasing the market share or the number of people of seats on a Sunday, and you look at the size of some of these churches, right? Nothing against a big church. Every size church has an advantage and disadvantage, but these things are in stadiums. And you question how do you have an active church community that's that's really a strong body when you do that, right? And in order to have that, you know, you need to you need to water down the message. And there are plenty of pastors out there, and some of them on TV, that uh, that do that. They take out uncomfortable topics. They want to focus on happy things. You know, they look at uh, they look at people as you know religious consumers, right? And not necessarily truly believers seeking the, the word and being fed. So you know, elements of these things tend to be right concert type worship so bands and hip young pastors um coffee bars they're very casual and and a lot of them they're they're you know they're geared to be more like a community center you know take the cross off the building let's not make it look like a church because we might offend people right we want to draw those in now the one of the challenges is that you know you're not you're not letting god do the converting in that sense right you're not letting the gospel do the talking you're you're trying to take the wheel and say well let's let's create the environment and, you know, there's an argument to be made for that, but, and we'll, we'll go through the but here in a little bit, Serena, any, any comments there? Uh, I also think it uh, restricts what you can do in a service to let the spirit move. Um, 
because if you're following with such a big group of people, you need to work through a formula, working through, okay, we're going to do three songs, we're going to have a message, we're going to do this, and then it's over, we're going to get people out the door. When you have such massive amounts of people, you have to work through a formula, and you can't stay and sort of linger in a worship song or in a moment of worship because of the mass amounts of people. You can't organize it that way. You can't just say, okay, well, we have to continue. When you have thousands of people attending a church, you have to be able to cut things off, which I think is a downside of this is you can't go long on that sermon point because you have to be able to get things through because of just the massive amounts of people that you have to be able to organize. Yep. And I think today, one of the examples we're going to, you know, focus a little bit on is really this idea of the purpose-driven church, you know, shepherded by Rick Warren and his church Saddleback, or we used, you know, one that he grew. Um, But, you know, the Saddleback is, you know, according to outreach100.com, right? This looks at large churches and growth in churches. You know, according to them, they have over 30,000 members of Saddleback. And by the way, it's not the largest church in this country. There are larger, um, believe it or not. So, you know, uh, if you go into church every Sunday with 30,000 of your your fellow believers, I, you know, wonder how many people you get to actually have a relationship with. Well, I will say that I think going to a large church, it could be very um, uplifting in a certain sense because you do have this idea of, look how many people are believers and who are in the fold of God. And I think that in some ways can be uplifting if you're trying to get that growth the right way. And I think, there, like we said, there are upsides and downsides to having big and small churches. Well, and you know, right, I think today in our in our church service today, right, uh, they talked about um, having sent some of the young young adults to the Passion Conference and talking about 55,000 people coming together from different churches and all over the country and worshiping together and the power of that. But, you know, that that's a great event, but I don't know if that's a every Sunday, you know, uh, method of, of success. But, you know, I guess the first question you got to think about what these seeker sensitive is, is, you know, what, what are they seeking? And, you know, it comes down to a few elements, right? I'd say a gospel sounding message. They don't necessarily want to hear the real gospel, but something that sounds like it. Um, you know, Joel Osteen is always one who says this, uh, God wants you to be happy. Um, you know, I, I've, I I couldn't find any verses that say that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about what God wants, like the obedience and, you know, loving loving each other, loving him, you know, having no gods before him. I don't know about the, the whole idea of being happy. They want positive and happy messages. They don't like to talk, put the lens on sin and repentance. You know, if you're convicted, you're not going to want to come back. You know, they want life advice, right? You know, the, you know, let's. And I'm not talking about, you know, let's go through the book of Proverbs and talk about all the advice in there. It's, it's really about the easy steps, you know, you know, Christianity for dummies kind of thing. Yeah, and I would also say a lot of it, they're Christianized Bible versions of a lot of things that are flying around, like, popular culture now and, like, Instagram or TikTok of, like, happy thoughts, positivity, do this to improve your life, set this goal, like, they'll take those sort of same concepts that are I think kind of around our culture today and then adding like a Bible message. So instead of just three lives to three steps to improve your life, it'll be three steps to improve your life biblically or like right. godly, which I think there are ways that you can bring that out. But a lot of them, they do just seem to be same stuff that you see around our culture and society, but they put a Christian spin on it because it is church. Right. And again, right. If we don't cleanse the heart first, and start there, or if you don't have a heart change, then our life's not going to change. I don't care what message you put around it, right? It's got to start with the transformation. That starts with the repentance of your sin, right? If, if you don't start there, none of these, you know, 10-step programs are going to get you anywhere. And I totally understand that for some people, like having a message that you're going to walk into and not be bombarded immediately with the fact that you're a sinner, you're an awful person, um, is sometimes a good thing. Like if we'd started by going to a church that was incredibly deep and incredibly focused on sin and repentance, we would probably have never stayed in that church. And so in some ways, um, having a church that was a little bit more, um, I would say like almost watered down in a message to a sense did in some ways help us, but there's an element of you then start to look, okay, we need to go deeper here. Right. Right. And and I think that's the key, right? If, if you start to go and the message is, is not as convicting and, you know, you start to hear something, right, and God's speaking to you in that message, how do you continue down that path? Because it is, is it a journey, right? Do you grow in the word? Um, you know, when you first accept, um, there's a lot you don't know and you continue to learn and, and it's a lifetime that you continue to grow and read, study and understand how you apply it, right? It's not a turn the switch on and you're there, right? So, um, you know, What's the, you know, what's the thing Rick Warren said about the Purpose Driven Church? He has a tagline for it. It's, um, where is it? Uh, is it the, um, 
Oh, yeah. What is needed today are churches that are driven by purpose instead of other forces. So he says this pretty early on because af- this is right after he's gotten through basically his introduction about how Saddleback got started. And I will say that that part of the story was very interesting. He has a lot of really inspiring points. And there's a lot of God moments definitely in when he was starting Saddleback and like a lot because he had like basically no money. and was like, OK, I'm going to start a church here in Saddleback and about <clears throat> how certain things happened. And it was a very inspiring story, I will say. But then he starts to get into, OK, this is his next point as he leads in basically to the rest of the book, which is about how to make this purpose driven church. Right. I, I, you know, and I, you know, the idea of going into a community and, and planting a church that'll draw the local people in is great. But again, it's about the depth and where do you take them? Um, I had a, a friend of mine who's a pastor. We were sitting over lunch and he said to me one day when we were talking about some of these programs and he said, you know, <clears throat> bad church ideas typically stem from, you know, improper theology. Right. That's the, the genesis of a lot of these things. So. Um, that that's that's the first thing we stumble over, right? So, um, and these churches, right? They focus on growth, but is it effective growth, right? Do we know? And what what have you seen as examples? And you know your studies here. Well, here's the thing: is it truly growth if you're just making um, people that, or if you're just making churchgoers but not disciples? Because right. we're called to make disciples of people. It says the Great Commission is to go and make disciples of the nations. It's not to convert people to come and go to your building to come to church it's to go and make disciples so are you really discipling these people so that they can go out and make disciples and in turn the next step and the next step right or are you just having them so they're complacent to come and sit at church and what how do you measure growth in a church because um a lot of the focus it seems in the purpose-driven church and the secret sense of movement is these numerical numbers how many members do we have how many baptisms have we done how many seats do we have filled right that kind of thing and well i think there is value in saying look we've had like this many baptisms this year. Isn't it great to see what the Lord is doing? But if you're not pouring into these people after they've been baptized and after they've professed their faith, does that really matter that they've been baptized at that point? Right. And, and, you know, are they truly, did their hearts really change, right? Or you're just getting people wet, right? I've had a friend who's a youth minister and said, I've got many kids wet in my life, you know, and not, not necessarily knowing after the fact you could see they were not really transformed, right? So we can, we can catch people up in emotion and dunk them, but you know, are, you, are they really actually moving in the faith? And that, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's interesting as we were, you know, putting this together, the latest issue of Christianity Today came out and, and lo and behold, here's a story saying that, you know, they called, they refer to this as growth without depth. And again, you know, the, one of the challenges is they call it cheap grace. There's, there's you know, there's no, re, no need to repentance. And if there's no repentance, why do I need to have obedience? So, you know, it starts there. Again, we're, we're getting into this. It stays, it stays shallow, right? And to, to look at that, you know, quoting from Hebrews, you know, chapter 5, verse 12, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk and not solid foods. Again, that's the, that's the, that's what we're trying to drive at here is great if you go there, great if you start to hear the message, great if it starts you, but if you're not reading, engaging, learning, and saying, oh, I've got to change my life, you know, are, are you, is it the right thing? And I mean, I could totally understand if as a model, you could start churches to try and draw people in, in a way that you send them out and then say, okay, th- we're meant to start introduce you and then send them to maybe have like churches. Okay. You should try and go here to like grow deeper. Right. But the idea is they still try to retain that membership. They have like these programs to try and retain it, but they don't really move forward from the same elementary topics in a sense. They sort of just stay in the same little realm without the sin and repentance and those difficult topics that really make up a large part of the Bible, especially when you start getting into the Old Testament and the books of prophecy, which is a very, very large part of the Old Testament. And you notice how much of it is like repentance and judgment and how much of the Bible is made up of what is going to happen when God judges the earth. And you start to wonder, okay, if we're ignoring a large chunk of text here, what does that really mean for the spiritual knowledge that these people going to these churches have? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And, and, you know, when we think about, um, we think about that, right. We, we sometimes forget that our first, our primary reason that we have, we go to church is to worship, right. It's to, you know, the devotion and adoration to God, right. Um, whether that's done in a, in a, you know, a community, uh, done in a church building, done in someone's home, but that that's first and foremost. But today, you know, I think we've gotten so used to thinking of churches as programs, right the ministries, the missions, and, and these are all good things, but they don't need the building, right? We, we can do that. You can do personal ministry. Um, I don't need those programmatic things, but a lot of these churches try to focus on all those things 
and while well, they may be good programs, again, missing the whole thing about creating disciples first, then using that to do those other programs. Yeah. And God can reach you anywhere. He doesn't, right. um, he can convict people in situations that you never thought, like there are stories of people like never having stepped in a church, never have anyone really talk to them about it, but something happens, they see something and they're triggered to just go and like read or look at something. Right. And I think that's the thing. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be this church building, like with these perfect like music and these coffee bars and this sort of trendy atmosphere to try and attract people to it. Yeah. And I think we have a, you know, especially in the Western world and here in the United States, right? We have a unique situation. And, and I learned this when I started talking to some of the some of the folks I know who, you know, came from China or Christians there and talking about how you can talk to someone and, and have them believe. And, and that person is actually sharing the gospel with someone for the first time and they're accepting it on the spot. That is so far removed from us because as a, you know, essentially it's called a Christian nation or Judeo-Christian nation. You know, most people would say they're, they're Christian, right? They grew up in some kind of church. Their parents took them to church at least a little bit. You know, they probably were baptized as an infant. You know, they had some churching, so they think everything's okay, right? So getting that person to realize that they're in the weeds and not really living, you know, a life obedient to Christ, that's a lot harder, I think, than people who have never heard the word, actually, right? Right. When you live in affluence and prosperity, I think it's much easier to— uh, surround yourself and try to fill yourself up with those things. Whereas if you have nothing, like absolutely nothing, like if you're a dirt poor and live in Africa or South America, I think you're much more able to see, okay, I have nothing. This is offering me something that's outside of this. I can see that this world has nothing left to offer me. And okay, this is giving me something that's going to give me hope. And um, you look that basically this world really does have nothing to offer us. But if you're rich or you're in this area where you've got power or something, it's much easier to be like, look what the world has given me. Why would I leave the world? Why would I want to remove myself from the world? Why would I want to lay those things down at the feet of the cross to come to Jesus? Like, why would I want to do that? And I think that's the other thing about the purpose-driven churches. We've mentioned already that there's a lack of repentance, but I think it's also, you're able to keep your lifestyle. You just sprinkle in Jesus every so often. like Where it's convenient. Right. It's Jesus is not a flavoring in our life. He's like the entire dish. Right. Like, this exactly. is, he's everything. He's the main course. He's not right. The- yeah, exactly. Well, and and if you don't want to take our word for it, right, that this is interesting. Willow Creek Church, who started a seeker-sensitive movement in 1975, you know, and they did grow membership and, you know, and quote-unquote success. But about 2008, they did a, they had a study and it took them, they did a four-year study to realize, is it really having an impact or not? And what the conclusion was, is they had to move from seeker-sensitive to believer-sensitive. So again, just what we're talking about is, Great, you're feeding people milk, but if they're not moving on to solid food, you're not going anywhere, right? You're you're falling backwards, right? And I think I think that's a great example of of a church that recognized that this is they're off path here. The other one that was interesting is this um, paper by by Charles Spurgeon is called she- "Feeding the Sheep or Musing the Goats," and you can you can just Google it and find it. But one of the things he talks about is that you know Mark sixteen fifteen does not conclude with the with the words, you know, amuse that do, those who do not relish the, the word, right? So talking about spreading, if people are foolish, you know, let them go. Um, he also points out, it raises the question, did the prophets come to amuse people, right? And, and this is, this is we have to realize what the past told us and what that life looked like and the realities of the, the world, right? You know, any thoughts on that point, Sabrina? Uh, yeah, I'm been reading in Jeremiah for my sort of own Bible reading and there gets this part where Jeremiah's like these people have rejected me like look at what they're they've done to me and I'm like the one true prophet and then he j- kind of draws the contrast in the text of and like of the false prophets who the people love and the people um like flock to and they don't reject and there's this whole thing about preaching the truth is difficult and people are going to want to hear the false things. They want to hear that there's peace and love. I mean, there is pe- immense peace and love in God, but they want to have that here and now. And that's kind of the thing with these seeker sensitive churches. They are in a way, I'm not going to put the label of false prophet on them because they don't claim to speak from God. But in a sense, they are sort of in this same realm of a contrast between telling what the people want to hear and being accepted by the people versus, um, telling what is from God, what is true. In this case, drawing the words from the Bible, what the Bible actually says, and then being rejected by those people. Right. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I think, um, you know, when we think about this, you know, I come back to the whole idea is that there's the Great Commission, right? And that's, this is, you know, biblically what we're given, right? And, and there's, there's, a, there's a few elements to it, right? The first is worship. And this is from Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. He said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. And that is really, you know, the act of worship. That's the, the fundamental focus of coming together in worship. Um, the second part is ministry. Um, this is from Matthew twenty two thirty nine, right? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? This is the idea of, you know, showing love to your neighbors and, and the people that you interact with and showing them in, in, in a various in a number of different ways. Um, the third element, evangelism and fellowship. So um, <clears throat> Matthew twenty eight nineteen says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So again, it shows you that. Um, and discipleship, right, is that the final element is from Matthew twenty eight twenty, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, it pretty much lays it out there, right? And and I think anything that's not following that blueprint, you know, you're likely to be in the weeds. Yeah, definitely. Um, any other thoughts here before we close on your behalf? Um. I'm just going to say, like, as a wrap-up of the entire thing for the, like, purpose-driven church in general, um, the biggest problem with it is there's an emphasis on letting people come to you instead of going out. I mentioned this before, but that is really the biggest issue, is that it's a reverse of what the uh, Bible tells us to do. We are told to go out and make disciples. We are not told to sit and wait for them to come to us to be curious. We are told to go out, and I think that's the one thing if you want to have a take away from the, the issues with the seeker sensitive movement and that is it. it's a misunderstanding of what the church does and what the church is for yeah agreed i always call it uh fly paper services you know we want to we want to have events and fun things that draw people and hopefully they they come land on that fly paper of the event and then they don't they like it so much they'll come back on a sunday you know i still ultimately land on i think personal discipleship is really what's kind of creating a situation that wants and people look for a softer church service. So you know, I still think that if we were bolder in our message and be willing to engage more, um, you know, these ideas of having to have a happy place for people to show up and feel good about themselves, you know, at the expense of the truth of the gospel is really off, is misguided. And if we try to be like the world, we lose what makes us who we are. We lose being Christians. Like the fact that we are not like the world is what makes us Christians. This is what makes us the church. So if we now try to go and be like the world to attract people to us, then we're not really attracting people to us. We're attracting people to something fake that pretends to be the gospel, that pretends to be the church, that pretends to be what Christianity is all about. But in reality, when you look at it, really, it's just a fake Christianity because we have to be different from the world to be Christianity. That's what it is. That's what it means to be a Christian. You have to live out of the world. We are not meant to live in the world. Yeah, you know, to that point, you know, Rosaria Butterfield of saw a recent interview with her and she she's written several books but you know she talks about it and she she was a you know a feminist lesbian anti-christian person who you know found the gospel through the grace of local local evangelism from you know from a pastor who you know knew her uh, and over a long period of time she recognized the error of her ways and, and you know saw the light um and you know and, and got married has children um but she also says you know i'm in a very fundamental church. Uh, I'm not in one of these progressive movements. So again, the, the evangelism brought her to it, and the realization is that this is what the Bible tells us, and I need to play a place that's going to preach that as opposed to the place that tells me what I want to hear that allows me to live my life around it. Right, and imagine if some of these churches, instead of having these seminars to try and, you know, just grow your life or grow this, if they had seminars on evangelism, how to do that, where would we see the church growing instead of these seminars, we had discipleship classes teaching how to bring others into the fold. Like, where would we be? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll close here as we uh, go through the next few episodes. I think our next one is going to be an interview about the home church. So I uh, look forward to having you on that one. That's a little longer than most of these, but uh, it was a really, a really good interview uh, about starting and, and managing a home church. So we're, again, we're thankful for you guys uh, spending some time with us. We, play, we pray that you have a uh, a blessed, uh, blessed week, and uh, pray that uh, you hear us on the next one. Uh, be good. Mm-hmm.